Okay, cool. All right, guys. So you guys are currently using the King tube and, um, you know, to be 100% honest, I, there's nothing wrong with the King tube. It's a great tube. And, uh, you're making this transition for a couple of reasons. Um, you know, and, and it's not because what you're currently using isn't good. Uh, if you were using the combi tube, we'd, we'd be having a different conversation here, but, um, you know, clearly this is, this is the, the next generation. Who's that the radio? Or so the, um, the eye gel is, uh, used obviously in a, uh, a scenario where you're not intubating, right? And, and let me preface this by saying the paramedic in me will tell you the intubation is always the, the, the primary standard. It's the gold standard. It's the one we want to do. Um, you know, the BLS airway is uh, designed for basically a rescue airway, right? It's a situation where it, it may be difficult to intubate somebody or, you know, there's, there's not a lot of hands on, on, on the scene and and you don't want to spend time doing that. There's, there's reasons for it. And it's not because it's the better choice by all means, no matter what the gold standard is intubation. And, um, I know there's data out there to show both sides, you know, that, that intubation is good. And there's other data that will show you that it's as good, if not better in some cases to use a BLS airway. Um, so not taking a stance either way there, but ultimately what I want you to know is that, um, I'm never saying during this whole training that, that a BLS airway is better than, than um, doing an actual intubation. So uh, this one, has anybody in the room used this style before they used an IGL somewhere else or anything like that previously before you came there or anything? Nope, doesn't look like it. Okay, nope, all right, cool. So what I do is I always start with uh, the anatomy of the tube. Right, because that, that's kind of the important thing for us to figure out first. You guys have a few of them sitting there on the desk in front of you, it looks like. And um, what I try to do is I'll turn the pointer on here so you can kind of see my pointer. Yes, I'm working on one. So like every airway device, you know, the there's a 15 millimeter connector on the top. And um, That'll hook, you know, your end tidal CO2 hooks right to that, your filters hook to that, your BVM hooks to that, and whatever else, right? Everything works on that 15 millimeter connector. Um, the next thing is you're going distally on the device is uh, this port here, which sometimes people get confused, especially in the hospital. Um, a lot of people will think that this is designed uh, to, to hook a syringe to. And in fact, it's, it's, it's an oxygen port. Okay, uh, what you do with that is uh, obviously there's, has anybody heard of cardiocerebral resuscitation? Anybody in the room heard of that thing before? Or that procedure before? Yeah. We're Couple, good. So on the west side of the state and other places in the country, they're doing this thing called cardiocerebral resuscitation. And ultimately what that is, is um, it's not doing ventilations while doing compressions during the first few minutes of an arrest. Meaning, when you do compressions um, on a patient, you're moving around 170, you know, 180 um, cc's of air, and the you know the dead space, and then the average person is about 150 cc's. So compressions alone are allowing you to move, um, you know, 20, 30 cc's of air um, into the lungs. So what they're finding is if you can give high concentrations of oxygen through that port. Uh, for the first few minutes of arrest, and I say few minutes because it depends on your area. Some places are doing um, six minutes, some doing three minutes. You know, it depends on, on the length of time for, based on the protocol locally. Um, so you'll hook to that and then just not ventilate for the first few minutes and let your compressions do the work for you there. Next to that, you'll see that there's actually a suction port. I think they call it a drainage tube, but ultimately, uh, I always think drainage as, you know, uh, gravity is your friend, so drain should go down. But um, in fact, it's a vent tube, realistically. So air and fluid and things can come up it. You'll see this tube runs all the way down the length of the tube and uh, comes out the tip of it. And uh, I'll tell you, not to, to, to create any, you know, nervousness or, or anything to have you scared, but it actually works. So you've been using King tubes for a while, and, and I 
I would argue that you probably haven't had um, a lot of vomit or blood or anything come up that tube or that hole on, uh, on a king tube. Um, I'll tell you that a week after we deployed these in, in a Western Wayne County department, I got a phone call uh, from, from them asking, it, you know, what was wrong with the device because the, uh, the, the emesis hit the ceiling of the ambulance. So it works. It's a vent that actually does its thing. So um, we'll go down a little bit further into that, you know, some solutions around that here in, in a few minutes. So as you go further down the tube, you'll see that there's these hooks and these hooks are what you hook the neck strap to. Um, then from about here to here, they have a, an integrated bite block. And that bite block obviously is if the patient becomes conscious or they seize or something happens where they, they start to clench down. Um, they're not going to cut through the tube and you'll lose that airway down there. Um, good news is it's big enough that it's going to go, if, if you were to lose something, it's going to go esophageal, not, not covering the trachea. Um, so uh, you know, the other thing you'll notice about this versus any other tube on the market is that it's, it's actually oval in shape. And the reason for that is that, and maybe you guys have seen this, but I never have. Apparently, um, there, there are times when people have an airway rotate laterally in the airway. Has anybody in the room had that happen? Doesn't look like it. Yeah, me either, right? I've, I've been doing this about 20 years or had been doing it about 20 years and never, never once did I have an airway rotate in there. But apparently it happens enough that the, it became a concern. They actually made a, you know, an engineering control to, to solve that. So pretty interesting. But then as you move your way down, you'll see this little, um, extra flap here. And what that is, is it's an epiglottic rest. And what that does is it, it, when, you, um, when you put the device in, it holds the epiglottis up and out of the way so that, that it doesn't flip over the uh, glottic opening. Um, and it also helps seat to the device where it belongs. Um, the, the end of it has an interesting shape and, and uh, it's funny where that actually came from. Funny by funny, not funny, haha, funny, strange, but it's um, they, they took a bunch of cadavers and they put clay molds down their airway, and that's really what they came up with. This is the, the exact reverse of what the average person's airway looks like, and you've got some sitting in front of you there. So, if you were to touch the end of that, you feel it, al it almost feels tacky at the end of it, especially when it comes new out of the box. Um, so it's, it's, it's does stick pretty well in there. Um, the, uh, the distal end of it gets lodged right into the, um, the esophagus and that's, that's how it works, right? This seals off the, the esophagus. You'll have obviously lube around the, the, the top of the tube. And then that epiglottic rest holds that back. The hard palate is usually right around the back and I'll show you another picture here shortly. And it, that hard palate is what's between that and this connection and the, the strap holding it down, that's what holds it in place. Uh, if you flip the tube over, you'll see that they put the size and the ideal kilogram uh, range for that patient right here. Then below that, there's obviously the, um, the position guide, which obviously is a tooth marker like your, your king tube would have. So very similar, right? Any questions before I move forward on that? Are the sizes and weights um, the same as uh, King Airway? Yeah, let me go one more slide and we'll get there. Yep, that's they're close. They're, and they can obviously be exactly the same for you know uh, copyright purposes, but they're close. And I'll, I'll show you that. That's the benefit to going from King to this or this to King. You know, it's very similar. So like I talked about earlier, the actual work, when that thing's pushed in, this is the hard pallet it pushes against that hard palate and then put the, that pressure holds it up against that glottic opening. And then, like I said, each, they designed it with each point of this thing mirroring, mirroring part of the inside of that airway. Um, so what I like to do is I'm not going to make you watch a bunch of video or a bunch of long videos. I'm going to have a, a couple of short ones here. Uh, I'm a real visual person. So in order for me to understand it, I got to actually see it. So what, it, what they I did is I found this video that has um, where they, they put a fiber optic camera down the airway and then down that vent tube as well. So we'll be able to actually look 
at what it looks like inside a real person here. The eye gel is a second generation superbotic aerosol. So you'll see, obviously you're going down the airway and then this you can see is where that cuff is all around the edge here. And it's right around that glottic open, right? And that epiglottic rest, which would be up here, is holding that epiglottis up out of the way. Um, works super well, which is, it's kind of weird. You wouldn't think it would. You think you'd need a cuff and you really don't. Um, so this is that gastric drain, they call it, or I, I call it a vent tube. Um, and you'll see when they go down, obviously they're going around the edge right now. You're going to see the, uh, the esophagus down here. You'll see that Clearly, the, the difference we all know is that the, the uh, esophagus is not rigid, right? It doesn't have the, the cricoid rings in it, so it, it'll actually close right down like this. So yeah, it's, it's going right where it needs to go, and it actually works, which is pretty crazy. Uh, to answer your question about sizing, so there's really two styles of eye gel. There's the surgical style, and then there's the resuscitation pack style. And the first, the large three sizes are the ones that come in resuscitation style. And what the difference is, is ultimately the, um, the head strap and the hooks. So um, that resuscitation pack, and I guess it has the, the, the oxygen port. So the, the resuscitation pack has those items on it. And those are the ones you're going to see in the main three sizes you're going to use all the time. Um, now they use ideal body weight. And um, we'll go further into that here in a second as well. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but I, I'm definitely not ideal body weight for my size, right? So uh, I've never been really good at measuring and um, determining size of a person based on that. But um, ultimately, that's what every device does. And truthfully, the, you know, the United States hasn't caught up. Every other country in the world uses the metric system for everything except for us. And um, that's why it is based on kilograms. Now, what you'll see um, is the, uh, well, let me back up. So you've got the three adult sizes that come in the resuscitation pack. You've got the up to four sizes of pediatric that you can get that, um, that do not come in the resuscitation pack. And the question is going to be, how do you secure that if you don't have the strap? Uh, how many people have been in the, in, in the room have been in the business? 15 years or so, 10, 15 years. A couple of us. A couple, yeah. So you guys remember when we used to tape endotracheal tubes, right? Mm -hmm. That's that's what they're recommending, uh, the manufacturer recommends for the eye gel on a pediatric setting. Now, those of us that have been in the business long enough, how, how often does the tape stick throughout the entire call on an endotracheal tube, right? So not all the time. And it's something you got to be concerned of and, and make sure that you're, if you're using it on a pediatric, that you, um, you know, you're prepared for that and understand that the tape sometimes will fail and you'll have to reposition or uh, re-secure the device. Um, so like I said earlier, I'm horrible with, with the metric system. So myself and, and many people that I work with now uh, will actually just write the, the pounds in on that section. Um, the good news is, and like you, you pointed out earlier, um, much like the King tube, these basically match, or I shouldn't say match, it's not the right term. They're very similar to that. So people that would, uh, that you would use a, um, a four on in the King tube would be the, the ones you use a four on with a, um, with a King or with an eye gel. So um, it's basically the same. Um, now, I, what I will say is, again, I'm not great when it comes to trying to figure that out. And, and I'm more based on, on height, right? We use a lot of, of, of that in EMS, right? So uh, it does work loosely on that as well. And, and I'm, real again, real visual person. So I, I look at things like, the, uh, you know, I, I try to find people that would be the right size for that. And everybody's familiar with the Big Bang Theory, I'm sure. So um, this is one solution, right? If you have a Sheldon-sized person, then 
um, you know, they're going to probably take the number five. If you have somewhere in the Leonard range, you know, basically everybody else in that range, um, except for Bernadette, they're all going to fit into that four. Um, Bernadette and smaller, you're going to have people that would be a three or, or further down that chain. Um, so I threw together this little table to try to help with that as well, because again, that's the way my head works. I use the uh, these R standard, not the metric standard. So um, <clears throat> you know the eye gel will tell you, or inter inner surgical will tell you that about ninety to ninety four percent of their sales are the number four tube. Meaning this, you know, this is where it equates for us. It equates for us that ninety some percent of the time we're going to be using a four on people. And if um, here's here's one of the things there when when the tube. I guess if it doesn't work, and what that means by doesn't work is if you place it and there's air flowing around uh, the tube, um, what do you think the problem is? What would you guys say if you're, you know, deductive reasoning here, you drop that tube and you have air blowing around the cuff down below, right? The gel cuff below. What do you think you should do? Put a bigger one in. Yeah, bigger. <laughs> you got it. Size up, right? So, the what they claim across the board is their biggest failures is if uh, if someone missizes the tube by going too small. They go too small. So they're obviously going to want me to have you watch some type of a thing. So what I did is I found the shortest possible video that gets the point across, and um, here's their. Let me know if you can hear it okay. This is their video on the actual placement. So I don't want to miss a step. First decide on the most appropriate okay, well, size of IGEL02 to use. Correct size is normally determined by weight. Open the IGEL02 rhesus pack. Remove the inner tray containing the lubricant, airway support strap, and suction tube, and place the contents to one side within easy reach. Place a small bolus of lubricant on the base of the inner side of the main shell of the packaging. Touching no lower than the bite block of the iGel 2 lubricate the back, sides, and front of the cuff with a thin layer of lubricant. Ensure any excess is removed. Grasp the lubricated iGel 2 firmly along the integral bite block. The ideal patient position for insertion is with the head extended and the neck flexed. But if this is not possible or is inappropriate for the patient, then iGel02 can be inserted with the head in a neutral orientation. A proficient user can achieve insertion of iGel02 in less than five seconds. Introduce the leading soft tip into the mouth of the patient in a direction towards the hard palate. It is not necessary to insert fingers into the patient's mouth. Glide the device downwards and backwards along the hard palate with a continuous but gentle push until a definitive resistance is felt. Do not apply excessive force. The tip of the airway should be located into the upper esophageal opening. The cuff should be located against the laryngeal framework. The epiglottis should be held in place by the epiglottic rest. The gastric channel should open into the esophagus and the incisors should be resting on the integral bite block. The iGel02 should now be secured in place with the airway support strap or taped down from maxilla to maxilla. To use the airway support strap, slide it under the patient's neck and secure it to the iGel02 hook ring using the appropriate holes on the strap. Ensure there is sufficient tension to hold the iGel02 securely in place, but not excessive tension that may cause trauma to the patient. Some adjustment of the strap may be needed. A resuscitation bag can then be connected to the iGel02 and ventilation can begin. So, if you're what, uh, what I'd like to bring up here is a couple of things. First of all, what would you do differently on that? It's a good video, but there's some things that I would do differently as a clinician, and I'm sure you would too. Probably not apply the gel into that package and then rotate it around and then just probably just apply the, the loop for one thing to the location you want it on the on the eye gel. 
Yeah, you and I both know we're going to do that, right? We're going to put it on the, the IGEL directly, and then we're going to, um, you know, move the, we'll use the packaging or whatever to push it around the airway, right? So, yep, I'll agree with that. What else are you guys thinking? There's, a, there's about three things that I, I notice every time I see that video. So the, the other two things are something they forgot, the other, and the next one is how they could, uh, they could better that process. Yeah. There you go. There's one, right? <laughs> that's true. I didn't think of that one. That's good. What else? What are you guys thinking? Yeah, you definitely. Pre-oxygenation is smart, right? The, uh, so the things I found are this. Uh, I'm a firm believer in preparing your equipment before you use the equipment, right? And, uh, and preparing everything in, in place. So first and foremost, they, I think I would have put the, the strap behind the nape of the neck before placing the airway, right? And that way, when it came time to secure in that device, you just reach down and grab a side. Like you said, you can keep your hand on the tube, reach down, grab one side, put your other hand on the tube and switch and do the other side, right? Um, additionally, uh, you gotta use an untitled CO2. Right, so that should have been there. We should never put an airway in a patient without um, putting the, a filter line on the end of that to uh, evaluate their their CO two levels. Um, now you're not doing it so that um, because you're worried about it going in the wrong hole, like you were the the combi tube. You know, you're also not doing it like you would an endotracheal tube, where you're trying to save it in the right spot. Because it really is only one place for this thing to go. You're doing it because you don't want to then have to take your BVM off later to evaluate what their, their CO2 is today. You also don't want to be bagging off any of that you know, potential CO2 before you know where you're at in the, in the game, right? So my opinion is you should always re, uh, like prepare your equipment first, hook your, uh, your stuff to the monitor. You, know, you should have the, the, whether it's your partner or somebody else doing this, you should have somebody attaching the internal CO2 to the monitor and having all the, the, the equipment ready, the strap behind the patient's head, uh, some sort, like you pointed out, some sort of, uh, of pre-oxygenation ahead of time, and then um, you know go go through there. So yeah, I like to point those things out. Um, now this guy, you guys know anybody in the room know Jim Ducanto or know of him? No, is that a no? So. Seriously, you should take your phone out, snap a picture of this, look this guy up. Um, this guy is brilliant, like seriously a game changer. And um, what I, what I want to show you is something amazing. So uh, Dr. Ducanto, I know the guy personally, just a really, really good dude and like approachable. I seriously talk to him about every other week or so. Uh, he's a, an anesthesiologist out of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And um, he's a huge airway promoter, uh, emergency airway promoter, it's so much so that he actually became an inventor. And uh, he invented a, a new catheter, which he's holding in his hand there, which again, I bet you if you look at the way he's holding it, none of us have done that before. Uh, he's, he's totally changed the way we clear the emergency airway um, through his products and, um, and through this thing he calls the salad technique. And SALID stands for, it's an acronym for um, Suction Assisted Laryngeal Airway Debridement. And um, so that's why I'm saying, you gotta check this guy out. YouTube, the SALID Airway Technique. It'll probably change the way you intubate. Um, then what I'm, what I'm showing you here is a version of what he's done in, uh, he, he went to a course, he put on a course in uh, South Carolina uh, from, with a guy named Tom Boothelay, awesome guy as well. Uh, this, this airway course, he went through how to, how to clean a contaminated eye gel. And um, I, so it, it's a must, right? You guys know as well as I do, there's a, a good number of the airways that we deal with are full of pea soup or beer or something, right? In addition, blood, some type of a, a thing that we need to be clearing out. Um, they're not all dry, right? So this is a cool technique. Should take a look at this thing and really consider it as part of your, your general practice when you're, when you're placing one of these things.
Please activate my suction. And I'm going to place this superglottic airway after I decontaminate this airway. I'm holding the suction catheter upside down so that this matches the patient's oral peripheral anatomy. I ask you, Peter, with your fingers to close the mouth of a mannequin like this. Can you do that for me? Yep. Okay, so what I can do with this is if I make a fist, I may not have a lot of strength in my arms, but what I can do is keep the arm connected to my body and kind of lean in and push the tongue and jaw down to put this in. I'm going to push this in, and then I'm going to move the suction out of the way so that the, the eye gel can make its final contact with the hypoparks. This is a contaminated superglottic airway. So what I'm going to do now is the demonstration of how to decontaminate this. I have a flexible catheter, and I have a rigid catheter. This is how this is going to go down. If it's easy peasy, I'll just do this. But what I really want to do is go down the side of the superglottic to the hypoflex. And then I want, just what I did with Jennifer, is I want to unshake her hand, get the hypoflex. Then I want to reseat the airway. I'm just going to leave this in for now next to the airway. And run the suction catheter down all the way to the bottom. And I take this off of that one. Suction the lumen. So guys, this, this is cool, right? So goes against almost everything we were originally taught, right? Who's with me on that, right? We were, we were taught that we should hold the, ca the suction catheter the other direction and, uh, and we do that. Do, we, do, you know, do you guys know why we were taught that? So the reason we were taught that is this. We were, the, the suction catheter was actually designed originally, the Yankauer, was designed for oral surgery. And it was designed to just bring up a little, you know, when, when you make a surgical cut and there's a little bit of blood or, you know, a little extra saliva in the mouth or something, it was designed to get that stuff out. So if you look at the, the tip of a standard suction catheter, it's really small. And it's really small because you've got to have somewhat of a close hole or a small hole in order to create the suction needed to pull up those small amounts of fluid. Well, uh, Ducanto came up with this, his catheter, the Ducanto suction catheter, that uh, has a three eighths inch hole in the end of the thing. And, you know, I'm sure a number of you guys, just like me, have, have been in a situation where the airway's full and, and your suction catheter's taken all day to get the, the job done. And you, you contemplate or even do pull the, the, the tip off and just stuck the, or stick, the, or stick the tubing down the, the patient's airway. And, um, you know, that obviously is not the ideal way to do things. So uh, he designed this catheter to be able to do that. He designed it also, like you pointed out in that video, to mirror the anatomy of the airway and go down and, and suction that stuff out. Um, you know, the other thing I wanted to make sure we look at here is we were also all taught that once you place an airway, you don't touch it, right? You leave it, it's in place. And if you move it, then there's liability and all this other stuff. The reality is, and he's pointed out more than once, that there's more liability in having a contaminated airway when we have the ability to clear it. So, um, that I will say, like I said, I, I, I'm a fan of both the King Tube and this device. I will say the, the one big value to this, this device is the fact that you can unseat it like you, uh, like you just did in that video to suction that airway out and then simply reseat that device without having to find a syringe. You guys, are, I'm sure you've been there. I know I have, I'm sure you have too, where you, you, put, you place an airway, whether it's a King Tube or an endotracheal tube, and next thing you know, the, the syringe is underneath grandma's couch or underneath the stretcher in the ambulance or something, and, and you don't know where it's at, right? So you can't unseat the old airway uh, and then reseat it easily. And um, I got to a point where I started sticking the, the syringe underneath the pillow with the stretcher, but you know, and without doing that kind of thing, you're, uh, you're, you're gonna be without it. So the eye gel allows you to unseat suction the airway, reseat the device without, uh, without any issue. Anybody ever seen that before? No, nope, that's a new technique for sure. Yeah, super cool, right? So I want to make sure you guys saw that. I want to share that with you too. So to, we're basically through the main part, right? So uh, what I like to do is just kind of go over the takeaways of the, the couple videos there, right? So the first thing is, I agree with you, and you pointed it out earlier, uh, pre-oxygenation is super important, right? We need to make sure that there's, there's enough oxygen in the, the space it, where it belongs, right? Whether it's the oropharynx or down the trachea. 
Uh, secondly, we need to make sure that we pre-connect all our equipment to the monitor before, right? Prepare before you go uh, into place in an airway. Um, you know, additionally, make sure all your equipment's available, which comes in that great uh, resuscitation pack package. Um, put the, the strap behind the nape of the neck. But additionally, guys, I guess I didn't cover this earlier, but I really, I really want to point out, I talked about that whole, um, uh, you know, emesis coming up the, the vent tube on, on the, the airway. Um, So, um, you know, you got to have your stuff pre-placed, have everything ready to go. And uh, like I talked about earlier, that when you, one of the things you look at, what's one of the things you look at when you get ready to intubate somebody? Let's run down that road. When you guys are going to intubate, what are some of the, the physical things you look for before you do it? Yeah, I mean, you can, you can check like the condition of their mouth, their teeth, their airway itself. See if there's trauma, the amount of blood, vomit, you know, teeth missing, anything like that. Yeah, right there. That's one of the things we're going to look at, right? We're going to look down the airway and take an inspection there and see if there's anything that's going to cause an issue along the way. That all happens before you put a blade in their mouth, right? Sure. What else happens before you put the blade in their mouth? What else are you looking for? What was that? <laughs> So what else can you inspect? What else are you going to look at beforehand? I mean, for a typical innovation, we're also looking at, you know, trying to size them um, yep. on their airway, you know, because we can determine on their yeah, trachea deviation, if they have a short neck or, you know, different uh, anatomical things. Yeah, you're going to look at the size of their neck. Is this going to be a difficult intubation there, right? You're going to look at those things. Now, there's something that only experience brings you, right? One of the other things that you do, I know you do, because you guys have been doing this long enough, without even, even if you do it without thinking about it, you all look at their belly, right? Every one of us look at that because there's two shapes of a belly, right? There's the, the heavy set guy who's just laying there and, and, and you know, they, they're obviously overweight, or there's the really round, rigid belly. And what, the, what causes that round, rigid belly? Gastric distension. Gastric distension, right? Somebody put fluid, air, or something that doesn't belong in that stomach in there in an excess. And so when, whenever I saw that, I, instead of laying right, you know, in line with them, obviously you lay off to the side a little bit and you actually have the suction stuff out, right? So that same principle should apply, right? When, when you're going to put this thing in, if you look at their abdomen and it's distended and it's clear that there's, there's stuff that shouldn't be there in there or too much of something in there, then you know, maybe consider pre-priming that, um, that, that, that port with, uh, with a suction catheter, right? And I know Oakland County doesn't let you guys do uh, Salem pumps or OG, NG tubes, but you can easily put a, a standard um, a suction catheter down that and, um, and have it ready so that it goes in the tank and not all over your, your, uh, your service uniform, right? So, um, so you got to think about those things, right? Ahead of time. Obviously, the one of the failure points is the right size versus uh, right size. The other failure point is if there's enough lube on it. So consider you have lube on there. Obviously, first step is prepare. Second part is clearing that airway, like we talked about with Decanto. Um, and then <laughs> I use that because we used to always use the I use that picture of the bass because we always called it bass grabbing the patient, right? You're opening up their airway. Obviously, you're not going to stick your thumbs in there like we used to do, but. Um, <laughs> Position their airway, secure that device, don't forget end tidal CO2, and in today's world, we're putting filters on things, right? So if you're going to do that, I know, again, one of the things that a lot of protocols out there are saying try to, uh, try to avoid putting an airway in, um, but there's also a lot of data now saying that you can do it, just make sure there's a, there's a, um, a filter in place as well. So those are kind of the takeaways. Prepare yourself, get everything ready before you do it, 
place that airway, you know, so you clean it up, place that airway, secure it, and then, then obviously um, evaluate things with N-type CO2. Um, some supplemental information for that. So the uh, inner surgical has studied and shows that you can uh, actually use the eye gel for a conduit for, inf or for intubation. And, uh, but they also throw the caveat on there that you should only do it under, um, you know, uh, fiber optic guidance, right? So there's a camera there. Uh, some people are actually willing to try putting a bougie down that device and then slipping a tube through it. If you did that, um, what, they, what they tell you is that the, it's the size of the tube plus three that'll let you know how big of a tube you can put through there. So obviously the three um, or the four, you add three, you can put a seven tube in there. If you have five on a patient, you can put up to an eight in there. Um, obviously, if, you, if you're, you're smarter to go a little bit smaller to give yourself some room. They have about a two year expiration date on them. Um, and though Intersurgical will tell you they don't want you to use this thing, Laridol actually designed the, their select or their newer tube tamer, tube holder, whatever you want to call it, to, um, to fit the eye gel. And the neat thing, you guys, I don't believe you guys are using this one yet, are you? You're using the one with the white on it still? Yeah, we have the, uh, the yellow or the pink. The yellow or the pink. little ratchet arm, yeah. Oh, you have the Ambu product. Cool, good. So um, there's nothing wrong with it. Great, great product. This one... I will tell you the, the benefit to this guy right here is that you can just push this device right in and it ratchets right down up against that tube. Those of you that may have used the other style Laredol uh, tube holder, uh, the white one has to be screwed in. This was actually designed by a medic from California, which is kind of cool. Um, just as a side note, a guy named Steve. So um, again, supplemental info, um, those gastric ports, uh, on the side there, you can put between a 10 and a 12 uh, French suction catheter or Salem pump down it. Um, ultimately, if you put a 10 down, it'll fit down all the adult sizes. If you, um, the five, you can fit a 12 in no problem. Um, but yeah, ultimately, again, your, your best bet is to try to stay with a 10 just for, you know, uh, you don't want to try to cram it in there if it's too, too tight. Um, so storing the device, one of the things I do differently than a lot of people is, I, again, being a clinician myself or, you know, a previous administrator, I like to look at the, the picture as a whole. It's not just about um, using the device, sitting at a table and everything's in a perfect world. We also have to look at how it's going to, uh, how we're going to store this device, how it's going to deploy. Um, one thing you'll notice, though, intersurgical, even in the video back there said, oh, look how small the, the packaging is. Uh, small is a relative term. And when you and people like you and, and myself were used to using a king tube, the packaging for the eye gel is much larger. And, and in our eyes, it's, it's uh, more cumbersome. So one of the things we've done is we've created a um, kind of a, our own priority airway bag um, that, that'll hold these things. It'll hold a, you know, a manual suction. It'll hold suction catheters. It'll hold uh, extra lube and pediatric sizes as well, things like that. Uh, and sometimes people will use that bag. It sounds, uh, sounds like you guys have them put in your priority bag or what you guys are calling your priority bag. And, um, and that's great. So it's more like this picture down below where you're gonna have them in your first in bag and um, you're gonna bring them in obviously for every call, which is super smart. The last thing you wanna do is get into a call and realize that you need that device and it's three floors down you know, out of the office building or something. So um, other people will keep a second set up in their airway compartment of their ambulance, which is commonly right there. Um, you know, that's, uh, that's kind of the placement thing, but you guys, like I said, are in the priority bag. Um, I don't want to go without saying this. You guys, we, you may not know about this. I want to make sure you do know about this. We have uh, a thing called Boundary University. If you haven't heard of it, it's free online CEUs. Uh, they're CAPC or what was formerly known as CIS beams approved, which means the state of Michigan approves these to be used uh, to renew your license. Um, so jot that down as well. Make sure you snap it with a snap picture with your phone or whatever. Make sure that you see that as well. So feel free to hop on and get some free CUs there. 